Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as John said, my name is Krista Marino, and I have the pleasure of working with both Arwen Ellis Dayton and James Dashner on their novels that we publish at Random House. Um, so today, I'm excited to introduce them both. They're going to have a conversation about writing and about their their books. But uh, before I start, I guess I can kind of explain a little of my role in that process, which would be that I was lucky enough to find both of their manuscripts from agents and acquire them here at Delacorte Press, an imprint of Random House, and then work with them on bringing them into the world. And so I feel very connected to their work as well. And um, I feel like all of their characters are actual real people living and breathing. So uh, I, am, I am very connected to these books. Um, I wanted to introduce them both and have them kind of speak to their work themselves. Uh, James has, uh, I think James, that you and I have uh, have published eight books together. We're working on the eighth book now. Is that true? Uh, something like that. Okay, and then Arwen and I have done one, and I right now am starting to work on her second, the sequel to Seeker. So let's start with Arwen, and she can kind of give you a short little uh, summary, or I guess what we would call in, in the world of publishing, a pitch on what her a Seeker novel is about. It's the first in a trilogy. Um, it looks like this. <laughs> Beautiful. See those shininess? Um, okay, Arwen, it, tell us about Seeker in, in a couple sentences. Okay. Uh, I describe Seeker as a heroic family tale that goes terribly wrong. It's set in the near future in both Scotland and Hong Kong, two very different locations. And uh, it's the story of four teenagers who, for their most of their lives, have been taught to fight and use some very interesting and unusual weapons. And as far as they know, this has all been for a very noble purpose, to become a seeker who is somebody who uses these skills to do good things. Um, they imagine this sort of righteous future for themselves, but the adults they most trust have actually been manipulating them for years, and now that their training is just about done, they begin to use them to do some pretty terrible things. And uh, Seeker gets kind of fast and dangerous and intense as they try to escape from this life and discover who's a friend and who's an enemy, and uh, find a better path for themselves into the future. And uh, the story escalates from there. Fabulous. Um, yeah, it's it's an amazing, I would say, um, the characters are amazing, the relationships are amazing, the story goes back centuries, and uh, it's in incredibly inspiring to think about all of the backstory that you came up with. Um, just a side note, the, the world is so realistic that it inspired me to go to Hong Kong myself. <laughs> Uh, and when I got there, I, I felt like I actually understood the world so much better just because Hong Kong is so unique and the way that you kind of envision it in 50 years, it's just so brilliantly spot on to how it could be. Um, so I encourage everyone to read it because it is high stakes, light sci-fi action adventure. Um, and I love it. And I am the same person that also loves James writing, which is, I guess, the say, you could describe it the same way, high stakes, action adventure, light sci-fi. Um, right now, I'm happy to share, this is the new collector's edition of the first two books in the Maze Runner series. But James also writes a new series that we were busy working on today. This is... The Eye of Minds is the first one in the Mortality Doctrine series. And... This is the second one, The Rule of Thoughts. Um, James, do you kind of want to speak to what you write? And and I know it's a lot of different books, but I'm, I'm sure that most people know you for The Maze Runner. Um, I guess maybe explain, for those of you who haven't read The Maze Runner or the new your new series. All right. I hope everybody's doing well out there. Um, it's pretty cool that we can connect via these fancy schmancy devices. Uh, Arwen and I are both extremely lucky to be with Krista at Random House, Delacorte, 
she is awesome. Um, and she's heard me say this a million times, but I always argue that her name should be on the cover along with mine because she is extremely integral integral to uh, what my books have become. You should see the first versions that I give her. But anyway, yeah, it's, uh, the Maze Runner is, is kind of the big thing now with me with the movies. But uh, I'm also very excited about my new series that more and more of you seem to be discovering. It's, uh, I feel like it's very different from Maze Runner, but appeals to the same people. You know, it's, uh, it's virtual reality and uh, cyber terrorism and lots of twists and turns. Um, I'm very proud of it. I worked really hard on it. And Krista worked her butt off on it as well. So you guys should check it out. And as far as the Maze Runner, it's sort of a post-apocalyptic story set in the future where all these poor, poor people are thrown into this terrible experiment. They live inside of a giant maze, and lots of bad things happen to them. But uh, it's, it's very adventurous, but also very mysterious and intriguing, and uh, plot twists, stuff like that. So that's me in a nutshell. Well, thank you, James. So oh, let's just get started here. We've got these questions coming in, and I've got questions written down. Um, that if the first question that kind of got voted up on our little queue was, what advice can you give aspiring writers? It feels like it's so distant to be sitting like at your computer writing stories and then coming into a publishing house and signing books for your publisher to send out to, I don't know, librarians and, and booksellers around there. Um, what would be your advice? Who would you like to hear from, Krista? Just jump in. Jump in, whoever. I, I guess what like, also it's interesting because Arwen, you published a adult a couple adult novels before this, so you have a different kind of path to publication. And James, you had written some middle grade younger books um, at a smaller press and and worked for several years before you uh, started publishing teen, kind of had your breakout hit. Um, in my, I'll answer first. I'll answer first. Uh, I would say patience um, and hard work. Um, that would be my advice. But now you guys. Well, my, since I'm a little bit closer to the beginning of my career than James, I would say I'll jump in. Um, I get asked this question a lot, especially by kids, because when you write YA, you get to meet a lot of uh, young people, which is one of the best things about writing in this genre. Uh, but I think it's really just write a lot and write a lot until you find your voice and don't worry so much at the beginning if what you're writing is amazing or if it's perfect or if it matches up to the story you envisioned because it might take a while before that happens but I think the process of writing is how you learn to do that and while other people's critiques can be used to help and you will eventually want that like don't let critiquing right at the beginning stop you from from writing just the experience of trying to get what's in your head onto paper will uh, sort of help you find what it means to be a writer at least that's what happened for me yeah that's, that's great that's, that's good stuff I think that um, you know Everyone kind of hopes there's a golden piece of information that will definitely rocket you toward publication. But, uh, you know, it's every single author you ask, you know, how'd you get published, they usually have some weird, crazy story about how it happened. And uh, mine is no different. Like Krista said, I did some books with a small publisher and just kind of took baby steps and kept working really hard on my writing to try to make it better. I uh, highly, highly recommend going to writers conferences. Uh, there's lots of organizations that do that sort of stuff. Just Google it, you'll find things. By far that was the biggest help to me. Uh, all the stuff I learned plus the people I met, the connections I made. and uh, But the, the two pieces that are really the strongest pieces of advice are the two that people don't really want to hear because they always hear it, but you have to just write, 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 practice, practice, 
Uh, it's just like basketball or piano. You have to practice it to get better. So do lots and lots of writing. And the second thing is exactly what Krista said, patience. And don't give up. No matter how many times you get rejected, don't give up. I think those are great words. I would I would add on my own also that read a lot, write a lot, and read a lot. Um, I think that I know it's important in my job reading a lot, and not only to know what the market is, but to know uh, uh, I don't know. It's you absorb it. I think um, in some way. I uh, find that a lot of people uh, they tend they often will get stuck in reading one genre, and. Mm -hmm. um, for me as a kid, I read everything. I read things that people said were good. I read things that people said were bad. I read stuff from writers from hundreds of years ago. I read modern stuff. I think when you read everything, you sort of think of what's possible, and you, you don't feel constrained to just writing one type of idea, which for me, it's like you said, you learn what's current, but you also learn what's possible. So exactly. I think reading many, many different things all the time is the, you know, the best thing a writer could do. And also, I know James, you you go see a lot of movies. You listen to music. I think that you can get inspiration from anywhere. Um, I just wrote an editorial letter to someone, and I referenced uh, kind of a, a piece of the world in the movie Birdman, and it's random that I would pull that movie about a over the hill actor into a teen novel. But it was just the way that they dealt with one of the elements of the world that. Um, I needed to use kind of as an example for the author to understand what I was trying to um, help her to do. So I think you know you can pull you can pull inspiration for stories and for uh, ways of writing from everything from all around you from art shows from from movies. Um, yeah, no doubt. I mean, every single day I purposely, as part of my job, watch a TV show or a movie or do some pretty significant reading because that's to me, for me personally, the number one most important part of my job is creative stimulation and creative input. Um, I'm constantly refreshing my brain with that kind of stuff and uh, I happen to love it so it's cool to have a job I love but it's a big part of it. I would just add, I love all the things you guys have said, I would add also Go out in the real world as much as you can. It doesn't have to be a fancy trip somewhere. It can be wherever you live. And just be in the environment with other people. Talk to strangers. Uh, eavesdrop on conversations in restaurants. You know, sit on the bus and pretend to sleep, but actually be listening to what everyone is saying around you. Like, be interested in people, because you would be shocked at how many inspiring stories are happening around you all the time. At least amazing conversations or funny dialogue. So I think we can learn from other writers and TV and movies, but I, I also just love the simple inspiration of uh, people you've never met and places that are nearby, looked at, you know, with new eyes. I totally agree, Arwen. I think listening to other people talk, conversation is such an inspiring uh, way to write dialogue. Um, it is. It can be hilarious, and also it, you can just figure out different types of people and different cadences of speech, and you know, listen to them. While, and if you use your, it's it's great to use your ear when you're writing something like dialogue, um, and you can actually pull pull actual conversations from from things you overhear at lunch. <laughs> Hundred percent. Okay. Um, the next question is, how do you put yourself in the right mood and the right place to write? Is there a certain time of day that's best? Does music help? Uh, I'll go first this time. Um, I, I'm very lucky that I can, you know, do my job, you know, write as a living. I'm not very good at speaking English. Uh, I do what I love for my work, and but I really try to keep it like a normal job. So as much as I can, you know, Monday through Friday during the day, I, I try to do a writing session in the morning, maybe one in the afternoon. And it doesn't always work because sometimes you have to bow down to your 
creative whims whenever the mojo strikes or whatever. But um, I definitely love music when I write. I'm a nerd who listens to movie soundtracks. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. I think very cinematically, so uh, some of my favorites are things like Lord of the Rings and The Matrix and Aliens and Braveheart and all these all these types of movies. Inception, uh, Man of Steel is a really good soundtrack. So that gets me in the mood, and uh, I like going to places like bookstores or coffee shops. Um, but, you know, sometimes writers use the excuse... I'm not in the mood, so I can't do it, but I think if you just sit down and, and really put some effort into it and just start writing, even if it's crap at first, usually uh, your creative juices will start flowing. So I, I, try to, I try to get something done every day. That's great. I know that um, I actually downloaded the Alien soundtrack because you said it was so good. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. It's creepy, eerie. It's perfect for my writing. Totally. Arwen? I agree with everything James said, uh, but particularly the last point, which is, you know, there's a point when you start writing, and you ha maybe haven't really been writing for a few days, or you're starting something new, and it's just uncomfortable to be in a room by yourself, and it doesn't feel like you can write something, or it doesn't feel like it's flowing, but the truth is, if you just sit there and are uncomfortable for a little while and don't occupy yourself with other things, you usually can start writing. And once you get started, you know, it gets a little bit easier and a little bit easier. And if you keep that up every day, then the time you have to spend ramping up each day, I find, gets less and less. So I, like James, try to treat it as a job. I have the series, it's sort of a big series, so you know, if it's writing time, I should be writing. If I absolutely can't write because I just need a break or I'm mentally exhausted for the moment, I'll try to do something that will help my writing, you know, take a walk or read something, you know, maybe watch something. But I do think a lot of it is just not feeling comfortable and sort of living with that and pushing through it. I'm lucky in that I don't have children like both of you, and so when I hit a wall reading, um, editing if I have a problem sometimes that I can't solve I'll take a nap and when I wake up a lot of the times the solution is just right there it's very strange how your mind can kinda work through things so I can I can sleep away my um, my problems do you guys have a way that you deal with like story issues story prob plot problems or is it just like a walk and you and you keep thinking about it or is it put it to the side and work on something different uh, some of my coolest ideas have come to me while I was jogging, especially okay. figuring out uh, tough plot points or whatever. I will just I'll go running and just that's all I'll let myself think about, and it, I usually can crack the puzzle. Um, one time I, I I had thought of this really cool word for something, just a simple word to describe something, and then I forgot it, and I could not remember what it was. So I went in my room and uh, I just sat there completely still for like a half hour, almost meditating or something. Um, and suddenly the word popped back in my head. And oh my was, God. So you're a monk. You're like a monk writer. I'm pretty much like a monk. Yep. <laughs> That's that. I love that story. Thank you for that. I. I think naps are always good. I have three kids, so that's not always an option. But um, take a walk. My best story ideas come while driving, probably because I lived in LA for so many years. Um, I think it just occupies just enough of my attention to do the driving part, but not enough to take all of my attention that I can sort of, you know, think through things. Sometimes do you ever like record ideas on your phone? Because I know that. Sometimes I'll be in strange places and I send myself emails. But I know people who actually record things on their now everyone has an iPhone or what you know, some sort of phone that has like everything inside it. I should do that. I've done that before. Before the recording your voice was built into the texting app. Now it's built into the texting app, so it'd be super easy to do that. I should get back into that. But I used to do 
a voice recording, which is its own app, but then I would forget it was there, and like three years later, when I already finished that story, I was like, what's this? Oh, that would have been great. Um, but yeah, now the texting app lets you just talk and record, so I should do that while I'm driving, I guess. But usually I can remember, as long as there aren't three kids in the car asking me questions, I can usually remember it long enough to like pull over and type something, or something like that. Safe writing and driving, thank right. you. Thank you for thinking of all of us. Um, okay, so new question. What do you think is the most difficult challenge to face as a writer? And I can only imagine being a public figure, it's so hard to kind of guard yourself from um, any sort of critical uh, feedback, which I, that's a hard part of being a human anyway. But, you know, you are out there, you're putting your heart out there in your writing. So. I'm assuming that would be a very difficult part of being a writer. It's hard for me as the editor of books to read any sort of critical review. Um, but uh, other than that, I would say, because that's kind of a no-brainer, what would be, what would you say is the most difficult challenge? Besides James, you want to take this one? That's, <laughs> that can be difficult too. Wait, what did you say besides what? Besides getting paid to write, because that can be difficult too. <laughs> Well, for me, I'll jump right in. I mean, for me, just the blank page is the hardest part. You know, it's the, when you have something in your mind that you want to write, somehow that first thought of the story seems perfect. You know, it seems like some absolute story that is entirely without flaw when it's in your mind at first, which is, of course, not true, but that's how it seems. And then, when you have to actually start figuring out how to take those pieces out of your imagination and somehow translate them into the real world, you know, as English words, for me that is the hardest part. I mean, it, it gets easier as you go with each project, but I feel like every time you start again, it's kind of exactly the same. It's like, how do I, this, you're like, you feel like you're at the top of this mountain of a perfect story and you have to be willing to descend into total imperfection to get the story going. Um, and that's hard because it never feels smooth. It always feels awkward and it always feels like I have no idea if this is going to work. At least that's how it feels to me. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's easier for you or you enjoy it more actually getting it out and or do you enjoy the revision process more? Uh, I just enjoy whenever things are moving along at a good pace. Like if I'm writing and I've been writing for several days in a row and it's really working well and I can get right into it, that's always really enjoyable. Same thing if I'm editing, you know, I'm deep into editing but it's going really well, I'm sort of moving through it, I understand the direction I'm going, whether it's me just editing or working off of your revisions, um, I like that. I think it's the stop and start that's the hardest part, the like I haven't looked at it in a month and have no idea what it's going to be like when I read it through or I've let your questions sit for just a week too long and now it seems like it's going to be this foreign thing I have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. Those moments are hard so I try to minimize that by not putting things off. I mean I think writers are probably the worst procrastinators but I try to minimize that because it is much easier if you just throw yourself right back in the deep end and keep going. Mm -hmm. James? Uh, for, for me, and Krista knows this very well, the hardest part for me is the revisions process. I am, I am truly an ideas creation type of person and so outlining and writing the first draft is by far my favorite part and I usually just flow through that really quickly. Uh, some of my books I've written in like two months just because I don't allow myself to do any editing or anything. I just, it's purely about the, the creativity and the um, you know, getting the story down and, and developing the characters and all that. And then, but I'm smart enough to know, and even if I weren't, Krista would make me, that uh, you obviously don't write a perfect book the first time. And so Krista and I go through several pretty intense uh, rounds of revisions. And this is no, this is not a criticism of Krista because I would not change a thing. But I just absolutely hate that process because I feel like, you know, I already created this. This is no fun for me to just dig through it, um, you know, trying to fix all these little things. Uh, 
And Which is why we started outlining. <laughs> yes, yes. Krista, Krista turned me into an outliner. I used to not do that, but um, it actually has saved us a lot of time in the long run. Um, to be fair, but, when you're dealing, I would say with both of you, you are dealing with such complex worlds that are kind of spaced out over so many different books that um, it would, it's got to be difficult to work all of that out. So, yeah. Yeah, that yeah and it's, um, I mean, I think any person, if you took your favorite book and you read it ten times in a row, Within a few months, by the end, you would really start hating Wilbur and Charlotte and uh, <laughs> all the animals. You would despise them and want to kill them. Uh, and that's how I feel. You know, after the tenth time you've read your own book, and you're starting to find, you know, it reaches a point where you just start to hate it. And then you love that's it again. Then you love it again. Yeah. Then, then you put it away for a while, and usually when my books come out. You know, I get my first copies, and I'll I'll actually sit there and read it for hours and be like, wow, this isn't so bad. I can't believe I hated this a few months ago. And you know how the the pain of childbirth, right? How when they say oh, that. Oh, yes. I know it very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, next question. Uh, okay, so I think this is an interesting question because both of you have such very similar books in terms of, um, you know, amazing high concept action packed um, worlds but Arwen yours is set in actually uh, uh, you know in in Hong Kong in Scotland in London where they are real cities um, and you've taken them and kind of moved them about 50 years in the future and James your books are set in some pretty um, high concept locations like the center of a maze or inside um, a really, really advanced um, virtual gaming experience. Um, things that real that you would never have experienced at all, I hope. You've never been stuck in the middle of a maze. Um, okay, so the question is, how much does research play into your writing? Uh, research. Um, well, you know, I won't lie and say that research is my favorite thing in the world. But, you know, for me it's just, obviously you always want your book to be as good as possible. I know that's groundbreaking advice right there. But, um, you, uh, you know, you want it to feel authentic and you don't want people to write you after it comes out and show how smart they are and tell you where you were wrong. So, um, even if you don't like research, you have every motivation to do it because you want your book to be as good as possible. So in both the Maze Runner series and the new series that starts with Eye of Minds, there's a lot of technology stuff. And, I, and I'm the first to admit, you know, I, I, go, uh, I go crazy with my, my stuff. But at some point I want it to at least be grounded in reality, to have some basis, you know, something cool I've seen in a magazine or on the internet, some speculative thing on a website like io9. Uh, I like to ground it in reality, but then, you know, uh, sometimes I might get a little far-fetched with it, but I have fun with it. But yeah, research is, you got to do it sometimes. Arwen? Think, Arwen? Uh, yeah, you know, I actually... I've, I'm probably kind of the opposite in that I love research. Um, I went to this great high school and I feel like research was one of the main skills you graduated with and I've always really loved it. So um, I kind of tend to do the, the, I go too far. Like, you know, I'm writing something that is essentially made up and I don't, Really, I could almost not do research and it would be totally fine, but I end up researching so many things. Like for um, for Seeker, I, I read a book called, this horrible, wonderful book called Royal Murder, which was all about um, royal families killing each other throughout, you know, for like the last thousand years in Europe, which really didn't have that much directly to do with what I was writing, but it was such great inspiration and it really showed you how awful families could get in the worst possible circumstances. 
Um, so for me, I love the research phase. And for a seeker, I also went to all of the locations a few times uh, while writing the book. So the Scottish countryside, where I imagined this estate was that the kids were raised, and Hong Kong now, obviously, but where I could sort of, it, it already feels futuristic, Hong Kong. So it was kind of fun to go there and absorb the current atmosphere and then envision what it would look like, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years from now. And of course, London, there is not as big of a location in the book, but there's sort of a few climactic chapters that take place there. So I kind of went there and mapped out the route of this one great confrontation scene that happens in the air over London. Uh, so did I have to do that? No. I, I do think it lent a lot of um, just the sort of essence and detail of the places, even though my story doesn't have to do with specific locales other than a few and or specific historical events or anything like that. Just the sort of detail and atmosphere of the place was useful. I hope it comes through in the book. Um, but I feel like aside from the travel, there was all sorts of things I researched that maybe didn't make it into the book, but just influenced my thinking enough and kept me interested enough in like what we could talk about or what could have been their history that um, I guess I'm sort of a research nerd. If James is a music nerd, uh, I'm a little bit of a research nerd. I mean, Krista, yeah. Krista, I was I was just kidding. I do all that research stuff too. I do. I way know. You research in the future. Future research like, on the future. On the future. Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, but I mean, your technology feels like it's an extension of technology that exists today, and that's what makes. I think your world feels so um, feel believable. I I don't necessarily personally ha know how to work my iPhone, for instance, but you do. <laughs> so you have a great understanding of of cutting edge technology that I uh, wouldn't be able to uh, draw from. And Arwen, I, like the traveling, it just you can tell these cities are real because you can you know you know what street goes to what street and um, it's almost interesting because I've worked I work on I've worked on historical fiction and authors will pull old maps and use old you know historical maps from the time period they're writing about and um, I feel like it's a great almost a crutch to have in writing to have those like documents and experiences you could pull from so uh, if I ever write any sci-fi um, set with extreme High tech gadgets. I will learn how to use my iPhone correctly. Um, but I that's all you it. need. If you can learn to use your iPhone, you're you can really pretty much do anything technological. I think <laughs> it's known as the most difficult thing you can learn to do with technology. <laughs> I can take pictures. I think anytime you read a book where it takes place in an actual city, you can totally tell when the author has done their research. Um, oh, oh yeah. Absolutely. So. If I, you know, I, the only real place I've had so far um, are Denver and Atlanta and uh, a little bit in Utah. And I chose that because I have been there and have walked those streets. So I totally get that. I love how, though, you've taken places and destroyed them in your book. So, <laughs> you, you know, uh, the Scorch is a part of the world that, um, in your mind you hadn't been there but you had to research what global um, climate change would do to it so you did research I we talked about also diseases and and um, how they would be transferred an epidemic or a pandemic would go through that those um, different uh, I guess stages of, of when a virus gets spread so yeah, you've done a lot of research, not just not in places. Yeah, it's all coming back now. Um, <laughs> okay, another question: taking from uh, moving from the world, I guess that you guys have have created into the characters. Um, I feel like you both have very um, distinctive characters. There's several points of view: Arwen and Seeker. And, but I would say really the main um, driving kind of emotional force of Seeker is Quinn and 
uh, James, everyone who now has seen the Maze Runner movie and seen Dylan O'Brien bring the character to life can't not love Thomas um, and feel his kind of desperation to figure out where what, what the deal is, basically. Everything is a question to him. Um, where did these two characters come from for you guys? Did they kind of appear fully created or did they, uh, or did they become real over a process of time? You go first, Darwin. Oh, me? Okay. Um, so I was like, it's your turn. Um, <laughs> you know, Quinn, it was interesting because she was a little bit fully formed. But when I say fully formed, it's sort of like this girl showed up in my imagination one day who wasn't there the day before. Uh, so it was like she was a real person who was suddenly kind of present. But I really didn't know a lot about her. So it, it was almost like she was fully formed, but I didn't know it yet. So... I think often for me a story starts with this feeling of a character and then there's some sort of feeling around the character and with Quinn it was the um, the idea that she had this amazing sort of noble life planned out for herself but I felt immediately that uh, it was not going to go that way and in fact that she was going to have this this awful sense of betrayal which Honestly, we've all felt some sense of betrayal at some point in our lives. So if you could just think of your worst instance of that, what I saw when I looked at her was something, you know, a hundred times worse. So it was the optimism and the betrayal together that kind of formed her character for me and I think is kind of the through line of the story. It's sort of how do you, how do you get over such a deep personal disappointment um, and realize the people you thought you trusted, you can't, and how do you move forward from there, but in a much more exciting fashion than it would be if it, for example, happened in my own life. Um, so yeah, I guess she was fully formed, but it took me a long time to find out exactly what that meant. Okay. Um, my characters definitely form uh, organically as I write the story. I don't really feel like they're fully formed until at the very least, my first draft is done. Um, but usually I start, I tend to, most most of my books are from one perspective. It seems to be my style. And in a lot of ways, that person starts out being me because I'm in their head, you know. I can't help but have that character think like I think. But then I know they can't just exactly be me or it'd be a really boring book. Um, Thomas and the Mage Runner would have just, hidden in the corner of the whole book and it would have been really boring and he would have done a lot of crying so um, <laughs> so in, Ma so in major he, cry, he cries a little he cries yeah, he a does. little he does. It, it shows you're a man if you can cry right mm -hmm. he cries an adventurous amount yeah yes. so so Thomas particularly I feel like is is me at the core but then as I as I wrote through the story and it was kind of unique because he starts without his memory. So in a lot of ways, he's literally being developed throughout the story because he's starting over. Um, and a lot of his traits and characteristics and little quirks and stuff just developed as I wrote. And then I would refine those as I went back and did a second draft, third draft, fourth draft. And he did become very real to me. And I'm not just blowing smoke. It absolutely still to this day blows me away at how much uh, Wes Ball, the director, and Dylan O'Brien, the actor, uh, brought Thomas out of my head and, and put him on the big screen. I mean, they just totally nailed it. I told him that, Dylan, when I hugged him, when I got <laughs> to hug him. <laughs> I know. The oh. high point, the high point of your life. The high point of my career. Yes. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more. Let's see. Um, how about this is a good one? I think. Let's end with. Um, I think. Wait. Let's go up. Let's end with a, a kind of a full, a little bit of full disclosure. Okay. So, not from the. I not from the. I guess not from going from the characters 
to specifically, I know people who haven't read The Maze Runner, you have Gladers. Um, Arwen, people who haven't read Seeker, you have Seekers. Where, okay, can you in one line tell the reader what each respective role is and if you can, the inspiration for such an interesting new job title. Okay, James, are you going to throw me to the wolves on this one, or do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I like throwing you to the wolves. Okay, it. it's good for me. It's good for me. Um, well, you know, a seeker is supposed. The thing about it is that the seekers are not what they are uh, advertised as being to these kids, but they are supposedly these sort of uh, noble fellows who have this special training and can use it to actually do good things. You know, they might compare it to like a knight templar from the Middle Ages who'd committed himself to doing right. Uh, but in actual fact, they are um, used by their parents for uh, any old thing they uh, can use them for, which often includes very unsavory acts, such as hurting people or worse. Um, so because they're, they're highly trained. Uh, they uh, are trained to fight with these certain fighters, unusual weapons, yes. but then they also the, the sort of secret knowledge they're eventually taught um, allows them to travel places in an unusual fashion. So it's sort of this ability to get places uh, that other people can't quickly and the fighting as well. So I don't know. I feel like for me it was what, what you would always wish to be as a kid is something, someone who would be like a knight, you know, who would be chivalrous or help people or do good things, um, which could be maybe the best life you could imagine for yourself when you're a kid, but then what if it was the exact opposite of what you had been planning all these years? So for me it was it was again that sense of betrayal and how do you get through that and can you still be true to what you imagined? Is there a way you can find to still be that thing even though maybe it doesn't exist in the way you hoped? Great. Great. That's well said. Then. Well yeah. said. James. I I don't think anyone is shocked that Arwen and I ended up with the same editor. I know. There's a lot uh, of fighting in both of your books. I'm not a fighter. The fact that she read a book about a thousand years of families killing each other and she has these kill children uh, raised and trained to hurt people, <laughs> uh, it's awesome. We both Don't let her meet your children, James. She'll train them. I'm I'm currently reading a book about Chairman Mao and all the terrible things he did in China. So anyway, uh huh. Uh, the, the Gladers, um, you know, that was totally inspired by Lord of the Flies and uh, Ender's Game, two of my favorite books in high school. Just you know, the, this concept of a bunch of younger people thrown together in some kind of scary or terrible situation and it could be a good bond or an evil bond but they will bond one way or another and uh, you know I felt like Mage Runner was sort of an anti Lord of the Flies I felt like they went a different direction but just that sense of community and you know having a word for it calling each other gladers um, kind of like the team mentality. Um, all that went into it, but that's another thing that just it developed as I wrote the story and as I saw these characters get closer and closer together and more determined to survive no matter the horrible cost or odds. So I guess that's where it came from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that we are actually close to having our time up. Um, are we any final thoughts? Any final final thoughts? Sure. Sure. Um, I would just end by uh, saying congrats to Arwen and her new book, and encourage everyone to check it out. If you like Maze Runner, you will definitely like Seeker. And I uh, also just want to thank everyone out there who went to see the movie, and all of you who've read my books and are checking out my new series uh, means the world to me. So thank you. Yeah, we're actually going to have an exciting revealing of a couple, a little bit of the new book on EW.com, I think, in the next couple days. So 
Um, it's called The Game of Lives uh, by James Dashner. And Arwen has Traveler coming soon, um, spring 2016. Um, doesn't seem soon to you, but it's soon to me. I will tell you that. <laughs> James, James, thank you so much for the kind words and for your amazing stories, which my whole family has enjoyed. Um, and uh, it's so cool that we share this editor. And to anybody watching who's giving a new author and a new book a chance, thank you for taking a look at Seeker. For me, it's just exciting to have something that was in my mind, you know, out there in the world that people can read. It's really cool. Thank you so much, both of you, for writing your stories and for being part of the Random House family. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. It's been, it's been fun. See you later. Thank you for coming by. Goodbye.